Hello, everyone. My name is Claire Havens, and I work at SFU Carbon Talks. It's so nice to see f some familiar faces out there from when I worked on marine planning issues. Welcome to our January Carbon Talk. We'd like first to thank our generous contributors uh, and our funders, the North Growth Foundation, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, as well as the SFU Center for Dialogue, where Carbon Talks is housed. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to the Sierra Club BC for um, having our presenters here today. Out there in the Twitterverse and watching on live webcast, if you have any questions, please tweet us at Carbon Talks or use the hashtag SustyBC. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are all standing on unceded Coast Salish territory. Our two presenters will begin with two short presentations, and then we will open it up to questions and conversation from the audience. The title for today's Carbon Talks is Living Forests and Oceans, BC's Supernatural Climate Allies. Our first presenter today is Dr. Colin Campbell. He is the Marine Campaign Coordinator for Sierra Club BC. He spends his time working on climate change outreach, steering committee work on the Sea Choice Seafood Campaign, and pursuing a goal of broadening marine protected areas and policies to include the protection of habitats to support critical biogeochemical processes, specifically the sequestration of blue carbon. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Colin Campbell. We have three key messages we'd like to leave you with. First is that blue and green carbon, blue carbon being biologically fixed carbon in the oceans and green carbon being the same but in forests, have a role in mitigating global warming. We also want to make the point that ecosystems where these functions occur can turn on a dime really from being carbon banks or sinks into carbon bombs or sources. And the third point we'd like to convey to you is that any global attempt to manage carbon, to mitigate carbon, will necessarily involve conserving and restoring both forests and marine ecosystems where carbon is sequestered. A quick look at a basic carbon inventory of the planet. You can see that by far the most carbon is in deep ocean water, 38,000 billion tonnes of carbon in the deep ocean. But the turnover time is more than 1,000 years, so this carbon is more or less out of our reach. The carbon in the surface ocean water and the atmosphere are roughly similar, and these are the areas we're interested in today. And just to remind you that the blue carbon solution is no silver bullet. There's only 3.4 billion tonnes of blue carbon estimated to be conserved in the ocean in the top one metre of sediments underneath these particular habitats. Now, the ocean has been of huge service to us in, who live in the atmosphere and on land. It's absorbed 93% of the heat that anthropogenic global warming has produced so far. And it's also absorbed a lot of carbon dioxide chemically into the bicarbonate carbonate buffer system. But there's a real price for this, and it's got to do with pH. And this graph, to me, is the most frightening graph of our time, I think. It has a 34 million year, sorry, 25 million year time scale. And in 2008, if you look on the right-hand side there, the range of the pH values moved outside of an historic range of 23 million years. So we're deeply into unprecedented territory with, with, blue, with um, pH and carbon chemically in the oceans. So any other way that we can sequester carbon is going to be valuable. Here's the basic carbon figures. We produce between 9 and 10 billion tonnes of carbon every year. A quarter of it gets sequestered into the oceans. The blue carbon component of that is 3% of the anthropogenic total, but nevertheless, it's still 50% of the emissions from all global vehicles, so it's worth thinking about. All of this is done in a mere one half of 1% of the surface of the ocean. So the blue carbon habitats occupy less than 1% of the surface area of the ocean. And yet they sequester more than half of the carbon that the ocean does sequester into the sediments. All of this is done by a plant biomass that's less than a half a percent of its equivalent on land. So a hugely efficient system. 
And yet, for all of that value, we, we, we see that the habitat loss rates are up to 7% a year, the highest for any ecosystems on the planet. And just to remind us of the um, climate context, the warming that we achieve at our peak will be in direct proportion to the amount of carbon we introduce into the atmosphere. If we want a 66% chance of less than two degrees warming, then we have an allowance of 800 billion tonnes, of which we've already used 531 billion tonnes, which leaves us 269, which by the way is three or four times the amount that we have in proven fossil fuel reserves. And even if we had no growth, no economic growth, we would use up our remaining allotment in 27 years, by the year 2040. And if we do achieve zero carbon emissions, the warming we have achieved at that point will last for at least a thousand years, and without any kind of sequestration of carbon out of the atmosphere, it will take another 10,000 years to adjust. So I think, I hope, I've proven to you that all carbon sinks are valuable. Blue carbon is carbon that's fixed by photosynthesis and it's either in the biomass of the plants that do that or it's in the sediments underneath them. It occurs in three main habitats. Mangroves, which of course are tropical. Now of them, half of them are gone. There are none in Canada, unfortunately. We do, however, have extensive seagrass meadows, not that extensive in BC, but sufficient to be of interest. And salt marshes are also highly productive of carbon storage. So how does this happen? Well, if you, went, if you go back 15,000 years, most of the planet, even where we are now, looked like this. The great continental glaciers and the ice caps were melting, falling into the ocean, raising the sea level. And the sea level reached its present level about 6,500 years ago. So there were 10 or 12,000 years of rapid melting, which eroded valleys, poured a lot of nutrient and sediment into a higher sea level, and formed what we now know as our estuaries, all of which are quite recent. So anywhere where you get, look at the bottom right-hand corner there, anywhere where you get light, life, seawater and freshwater mixing with a variable salinity, nutrients and sediment, then you have the conditions for blue carbon deposition and storage. It happens like this, in, if, using eelgrass beds as an example. The macroflora, which is the um, leaves and branches above ground, and the roots and rhizomes beneath the ground, that's one place where carbon is fixed and can be buried and stored. There's a microflora that lives on the leaves of that eelgrass, which can be even more productive than the macroflora. It also dies and falls to the ground and gets buried. The situation is ideal for phytoplankton because it's shallow, there's light, and there's nutrients, and the water is um, well mixed. And we know from isotopic studies that most blue carbon, in fact, has a planktonic origin, not from the macroflora. And finally, there's this weird thing called the microbial loop, and it's got to do with the fact that nitrogen is usually limiting in seawater, whereas water, light, and CO2 are not. So you need nitrogen to make proteins, but you don't need it to make carbohydrates. And phytoplankton tend to overproduce carbohydrates and excrete it into the ocean, and that feeds bacteria and archaeans, the relatives of bacteria, and they also um, die and fall down. So they're the four main sources of blue carbon, and you can see that it's very habitat specific. Just to make a key difference between what Jens is going to talk about, if you look at this graph, the little green stripe is the proportion of carbon in the living versus the sediment underneath. So seagrass is a tiny proportion, but in all cases, whether salt marsh or mangroves, it's the sediment that's valuable. Here's a quick balance sheet. Carbon is Blue carbon is sequestered at somewhere between 120 and 330 million tonnes a year. We know that there's 3.4 billion tonnes buried in the top one metre. A lot of these um, deposits are deeper than that. And, but here's the kicker at the bottom. Habitat destruction is releasing somewhere between 40 and 330 million tonnes of blue carbon every year. And if you look back to the top line, you'll see that the loss is roughly equal to the gain, so we're in essentially a neutral position. If that carbon had value the way carbon has value in um, offsetting um, structures, it could be worth, at $41 a tonne, between six and $50 billion a year. So this is um, uh, an area of high interest. <coughs> 
Now, most of the information I've just given you was reported in 2009 in a couple of United Nations publications. And I summarized it and made it specific to British Columbia with this publication. And here's the BC situation in brief. We have 442 estuaries. 43% of them are under some kind of threat from development. Only 123 have any conservation area attached to them, and 317 of them have no protection whatsoever. <coughs> so we have 60 kilometers of salt marsh. Not much, it used to be more than double that, but the Fraser River development did away with the remainder. There's 335 kilometers of intertidal seagrass meadows. We know there's a lot more below the low tide line, but we have yet to measure it accurately. So it sequesters somewhere between 150 and 660 thousand tons of carbon a year. And just by way of comparison, 100 kilometers squared, square kilometers of boreal forest actually sequesters less than that. So if you are spending money to protect an area of habitat to pre preserve carbon, you'd get more bang for your buck in the ocean than you would in the forest. However, the forests have a bigger potential, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, this information has been used, and um, Laura McCauley is here today, who's the project manager for Project Watershed. This is a proposal to establish blue carbon offsetting, um, which allows funding to remain local by way of habitat restoration, wildlife conservation, with the consequence of mitigating climate change. We have some protocols these days for um, offsetting systems in blue carbon, the ver verified carbon standards for the voluntary um, offsetting process cover mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. But importantly, and just to finish up on this point, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation is a body, it's a sidearm of NAFTA, and they have a project in process right now, which you'll see written down there at the bottom, North America's Blue Carbon, assessing the role of coastal habitats in the continent's carbon budget. And this is a very important project because they're spending $450,000 over two years to develop protocols of measurement and mapping, to actually improve the mapping of blue carbon habitats, and to establish joint research partnerships on the ground where these things can be actually managed. And the whole goal, of course, is to quantify the blue carbon contribution to the continental carbon cycle so that policies and um, other strategies can be developed to protect habitats for their role as carbon sinks and also to prevent the damage to habitats which already are carbon sinks. And last slide, just to remind you that these are very important habitats, especially eelgrass. Eelgrass has been called the salmon highway. Every salmon transits eelgrass in two directions during its life cycle. 80% of BC's coastal wildlife has some part of its life cycle dependent on eelgrass beds. And there are, of course, these other um, ecosystem services that are provided. So this is my brief introduction to blue carbon, and I'm going to hand over to Jens Weiting, who's going to talk to us about the same function of forest. Jens Feiting is the forest and climate campaigner for Sierra Club BC. He works primarily for the protection of the Great Bear Rainforest and to raise awareness about the threat of global warming and the increasing emissions from BC's forests and fossil fuel exports. Prior to coming, coming to Canada, Jens worked as a forest campaigner in Germany and in Rainforest Reserve in Nicaragua. Welcome, Jens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you to the entire team of the Carbon Talk, and uh, thanks to all of you to, for attending this talk. So I will talk about the uh, incredibly important role of our forests in the fight against global warming, and why British Columbia's forests are particularly outstanding in this global context. So there are a number of reasons why we should care deeply about forests. Uh, um, most of the world's species, incredible amount of biodiversity depends on natural forests. Hundreds of millions of people directly depend on forests, um, live in forest areas or of forest lands. And of course, they are um, regulating our climate. <clears throat> 
Forests are also incredibly beautiful. This is a photo from my uh, first trip to a tropical rainforest, uh, to the Amazon region of uh, Ecuador in 1989, which turned out to be a very influential experience for, for my studies and, and work decisions. So this is uh, a bit shocking look at the Keeling curve, the uh, increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And uh, I found it particularly mind-boggling to see that uh, just 25 years ago, 19, around 1989, we, we passed this critical threshold, 350 parts per million, which is now considered a relatively safe limit to maintain a stable climate and, and life as we know it. And we are now um, pretty close to 400 parts per million, and um, the last time in Earth history, several million, millions of years ago, when we had 400 parts per million, temperature was essentially several degrees warmer, and uh, sea level was many meters higher than today. And unless we turn this around, we will see uh, this increasing and um, facing really dangerous global warming. So again, the three key messages, three things we would like to highlight today, and uh, here I'm doing it in the context of our forest. Forests are slowing down humid caused climate change by, by absorbing large amounts of carbon. They can turn from a carbon bank to a carbon bomb. The world's forests are storing about 340 gigatons of carbon. For comparison, our annual global emissions, again, are about 10 gigatons. And any, any global plan to stabilize the climate will require to keep and restore forests as carbon sinks. Again, currently of um, our emissions, about half of them end up in the atmosphere, about a quarter in our oceans, and about a quarter um, uh, gets absorbed by terrestrial ecosystems, primarily forests. So they are helping us to, to absorb carbon, but they are also contributing to emissions because we have obviously a history of deforestation. This is an example from a forestry commission of the UK government showing that we have lost, we have reduced forest cover from about 50% to about 30% today. And uh, in the process, we have lost about 120 gigatons of, of carbon that was once stored in these forests and contribute to, uh, to emissions. More recently, many of you probably saw this in November, um, very amazing mapping project, University of Maryland using Google technologies, found that just in the last 12 years, 2000 to 2012, uh, we have seen about one and a half million hectare, uh, square kilometers net loss of, of forests. That's uh, equivalent to 1.5 times the area of British Columbia. That's a bad trend. And then we have to um, remind ourselves that this is showing only deforestation. The other big problem we are dealing with is degradation of forests. And uh, in many parts of the world, degradation is actually the more serious problem. British Columbia is an example. We have relatively stable forest cover in British Columbia um, with only a small amount of deforestation. <coughs> but uh, we, we are losing. Um, forest health. Our forests are not as healthy as in the past. Um, and British Columbia's forest should be an amazing ally in the fight against climate change because they're globally outstanding. There are several maps, world maps, that show how they are um, uh, uh, remarkable in terms of global forest carbon density. We have forests that in some ecosystems can store over 1,000 tons of carbon per hectare. We also have maps, similar maps indicating tree height. This is a NASA map from 2010. And again, our Pacific Northwest region uh, is outstanding with uh, trees that, that reach enormous height. So they should be uh, an ally in the fight. Unfortunately, British Columbia's forests are currently a carbon source, not a carbon sink. And just a few days ago, Sierra Club BC put out a press release, a backgrounder, to raise awareness about this problem. Um, they are now a source uh, since about 2003. Here are a few numbers just from um, the recently published data. This is on a BC government website, but it's difficult to find, and nobody is uh, discussing it. 
So we have official emissions that show up in um, the greenhouse gas inventory report, about 62 million tons in 2011, primarily from burning fossil fuels. But then we have uncounted emissions from forest lands, and they were just in 2011, 35 million tons. They are primarily from logging, 71 million tons in 2011. Portion of that remains stored in wood products. Uh, we had uh, uh, some emissions from fires. They were much worse in some of the more recent years. 2010 was much higher. And then we have what is referred to as annual processes. That's the carbon sink function. So the trees that remain healthy, that continue to sequester carbon, that number today is smaller than in, in uh, 10 years ago or previously because the mountain pine beetle infestation caused a lot of trees to die and they're no longer sequestering carbon. So this is a bit closer look to understand the uh, last 20 years here. The uh, black line is showing that we had a carbon sink um, until 2003 and then it goes over the zero line and they went up. Last year was a little bit less. Um, what you can see here is relatively stable contribution to emissions from um, logging in light green. Some fire emissions, some serious years in red. A portion of that is slash burning, which could be easily avoided. And then uh, the uh, darker green is uh, the uh, carbon sink function, which is now greatly reduced, unfortunately. This is an estimate from our recent report. Um, overall, we believe that we have lost about 270 million tons of carbon dioxide in this period, the nine years, and we accounted for um, certain portions stored in, in wood products. So what can we do about these emissions from forests? There are a number of things we can do in terms of increasing conservation, improved forest management, lots of things that need to be done looking at mountain pine beetle uh, affected areas, fire and so on. But uh, right now I would like to focus on the timing issue because we have very little time to reduce emissions and avert dangerous global warming. So things that have an immediate benefit that make a difference in the next 10 or 20 years are way more important than some of the other things we might do. This is uh, an example from a more from an earlier IPCC report and as you can see, some of the proposed actions have to do with increasing forest area, for example, planting forests. Some of them have to do with <coughs> maintaining forest area, maintaining the carbon density. And then you can see that these examples will have immediate timing impact. Um, because if we, for example, avoid logging of old growth today, that will result in avoided emissions immediately. And uh, planting trees is great, but it will uh, take a significant amount of time before you can see a difference. So then there is a, um, a perception out there that old trees and old growth forests are no longer absorbing carbon, that they are dying, they are releasing carbon. There's more and more new research that shows that's not the case. This just came out a few days ago. Uh, maybe you saw the significant media coverage, old, older trees, um, continue to sequester carbon. They are actually absorbing way more carbon than, uh, than younger trees. In some cases, um, a single older tree can in one year sequester the equivalent carbon mass that's contained in an ent entire middle-aged tree. And here's another example. Um, carbon sequestered uh, annually by a hectare of older forest in our region in a temperate climate zone, that's about two tons of uh, carbon per hectare annually. So that's a nice combination of, of maintaining uh, a very um, effective carbon sink, uh, keeping the carbon on the ground, and have some additional benefit uh, year after year. <laughs> and unfortunately, logging of old growth, particularly along our coast, uh, um, with forests that haven't been disturbed in thousands of years, releases significantly more um, carbon storage than, than logging second growth, for example. So we estimated, for example, 2011, um, about 5,700 hectares logged on just Vancouver Island, the south coast, and that resulted in approximately a carbon loss of uh, 3 million tons of carbon dioxide, which happens to be the equivalent to what we believed we, we had just reduced the same year um, when we looked at our official emissions, right? 
carbon tax and some other uh, positive steps, but we are losing it in the forest and we are not paying enough attention because we are not taking a closer look. So good news story, Great Bear Rainforest Agreements underway and if you saw the newspaper today or listened to the radio, uh, we just worked with uh, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, Forest Ethics and a group of logging. Can you still hear? Yeah. Finalize a proposal how to implement the final step of implementing the Great Bear Rainforest Agreements. This would increase conservation to close to 70% of the forest of the region and in an earlier study, we estimated that would result in about 150 million tons of carbon dioxide um, maintained on the ground, not being released through logging of, of old growth. And this is a process that is informed by science. Um, we are building on ecosystem-based management. The key lesson is that if you want to keep your biodiversity, your species, you have to set aside a certain amount of forest, and we have for example, undertaken a study to look at um, forest ecosystems, particularly in the south, that are now below 30% remaining old growth forest. That's being referred to as high ecological risk for biodiversity, and this can be used to inform the discussion, to inform solutions between companies, government, First Nations, environmental organizations. This is obviously an example of um, uh, regions where we should take a look at phasing out old growth logging in the near future if we have so little remaining. In some cases we need to restore forests as well. Um, this is all pretty dire, but uh, I found this quote from Tim Flannery's book, Now or Never, very inspiring because he reminds us that plants represent an astonishingly effective means of carbon capture each year drawing down approximately 8% of the atmospheric carbon. At that rate, it would take only 12 years to draw all the carbon out of the atmosphere. Of course, plants die and rot, releasing a similar amount of carbon. But if only a small part of the carbon captured by plants could be stored more or less permanently, a great inroads could be made. And uh, if I go back to this slide one more time, this was uh, somewhat depressing, but it's kind of reassuring to, to remind ourselves that if those 120 gigatons of carbon were once stored in forests and other uh, terrestrial ecosystems, that they could potentially be sequestered again by forests and other ecosystems. But it will require action, it will require hard work to, to uh, protect and restore forests. Thank you. Thank you. We will now open it up to questions. Um, please keep your questions brief so we can fit in as many as possible. I will also take questions from Twitter. My colleague Kian will be reading them out. Does anybody have a question for our two speakers? Hi, thank you for the talk. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any projection into the future as it seems like we're headed towards uh, temperature increase and uh, more carbon in the atmosphere. Um, when uh, the ecosystem becomes unhealthy and therefore doesn't act in carbon uh, sequestration anymore, both the ocean which becomes more acidic, I understand, and the forests, which become unhealthy. I, I was just, it's a depressing thought, but I was just wondering about that. I'm not exactly sure what the question was, but you, what you said is, is precisely true. Um, ecosystems are on a cusp. Um, we know that there are other sources of carbon that will be released by ongoing temperature increase. There's methane in the oceans, there's methane in um, the Arctic tundra, and these things um, have thresholds of release. And so cr critical in the moment is to keep the temperature down. And the way to keep it down is there's only two ways to do it, and that is to put less into the atmosphere and take out what you can. So this is why we are stressing and putting emphasis on existing carbon sinks because to actually construct geoengineering methodologies for removing um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are uh, 
dubious at best and it's certainly expensive no matter what they turn out to be. Uh, I'm wondering why the province doesn't count the forest-based emissions um, if they are so high and uh, how the province has responded to the fact that it looks like about half of our emissions um, are coming from uh, from forestry. Well, the the reason why they are not counting it is um, related to international agreements and negotiations. Um, Canada had a choice at some point after the Kyoto Protocol got negotiated. If um, several country, countries um, insisted they, they should have a choice whether they uh, can count it or not. At the time, they were hopeful that forests would continue to sequester more carbon and that uh, it might help them to look good, but it turned out that they became a carbon source and they negotiated an option and they, Canada decided to, to not count. So the provinces are following um, this approach and I think most importantly, um, it's not so much about lumping it together. It's more important to keep an eye on it and um, deal with the issue, uh, undertake more research and develop solutions. Right now, they are kind of hidden. One option would be to have two emissions reports that are equally prominent and that um, would uh, get similar attention and uh, policy discussion, that might be a solution because it's true that emissions from fossil fuels and emissions from forests have to be dealt with in very different ways. Right now, it's not okay to simply have a data sheet on, on, the, uh, on the website, it's not enough. Colin, did you have something to say about that as well? In terms of reforestation, which is more effective, trying to improve the health of the forests we already have and make them thicker with more trees, or to plant new forests? That's a nice one. That depends on, on the ecosystem. Um, uh, globally, forests are very different, and um, even within British Columbia, we have very different ecosystems. Um, if you think about the coastal temperate rainforest the ecosystems in the interior, um, there's a lot of restoration work to be done now in the, those areas that are impacted by the mountain pine beetle, and we have made it worse by allowing these uh, um, extremely extended, large um, clear cuts in the interior to salvage some of the of the uh, timber. Um, if you take a closer look at uh, this region, for example, you will see that not all the forest is similarly affected. Some forests have a um, significant percentage of healthy trees, uh, younger trees, other species that are not attacked by the beetle. Um, so it would be more intelligent to undertake more planning, more research, um, restore and undertake reforestation in some places and in, in other areas leave the forest alone because that would allow um, the younger trees, remaining healthy trees to, to uh, fill the niche and uh, sequester more carbon while other trees um, slowly decompose and release carbon. It's really important to um, to keep in mind that uh, dead trees are not immediately releasing carbon. Um, some dead trees can st continue to store carbon for hundreds of years because it takes such a long time until they decompose. Wow. Just add one point, and that is that um, trees grow in soil, and soil also holds a lot of carbon. And so the actual act of cutting a forest and then planting it often releases the carbon from the soil and you've got a long time before it's back to where you started. So in principle, I think it's better to leave them alone at this point and where they're already down, replant them. Um, I noticed that, um, uh, I know the topic is about forestry, but uh, agriculture, does agriculture have a role to play? We do have orchards and I know that the carbon issue for soils is seriously in trouble. We've lost most of our topsoil, which is high, highly carbon-based, and our carbon-to-nitrogen ratios have seriously declined. 
thus lowering productivity, and we've mismanaged water. And uh, to me, that uh, connects to biofuels. I, I personally don't believe that bio biofuels are our, is the solution to uh, our fuel shortages or energy. But um, you haven't mentioned it, and I know I wondered about the boreal. Does it photosynthesize over the winter? I know the BC for uh, coastal forests certainly photosynthesize throughout the year. So, there, so there's a cyclical relationship about carbon capture in the entire forestry of Canada anyway, certainly in the north. Well, uh, what does agriculture have mm -hmm. a role to play? It's, it's a very good point. So it's unfortunate that we are only talking about forests and oceans today. Um, grasslands, uh, wetlands, uh, there are lots of other ecosystems that are similarly important uh, that um, should be discussed as well. And, and agriculture is a huge um, factor in, in influencing emissions. Industrial agriculture, definitely. And um, we know that there are many options to reduce emissions from agriculture to, to have, uh, similar like in forest, to have both um, economic activity and continue to sequester carbon, particularly in soils. Soils are incredibly important. And it really depends on how we use them in agriculture. is obviously a key factor, whether we can maintain and continue to sequester probably want to add something to this topic. Just one point, and that is that agriculture has two issues. One is the extent to which we do it and the amount of land that's been alienated by that act. And the other is the way we do it. And in fact, the figures are roughly that for every calorie of food energy we get out of our agricultural system, we put in 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy, either as fertilizer, tractor, dis um, distribution, all of those things. So. There's a real negative balance sheet on agriculture. The, um, the, the devil is in the details, of course, and the fact is that while we force agriculture with hydrocarbons, we actually do increase the productivity over area. If we want to recover it, we're going to have to figure out a way to do agriculture with slightly lower productivities but more sensible ecologies. We're going to take a uh, question from the Twitterverse. Uh, this question comes from at Brent Granby, and the question is, is there a role for cities and urban forests in sequestering and becoming carbon sinks? For, for sure. Um, I cannot give you examples. Uh, I remember that David Suzuki Foundation released a report a few years ago highlighting the incredible um, economic services that ecosystems provide in the lower mainland region. That would be an example to look at. But um, it's really um, key to think about how um, every ecosystem and every uh, land use can be um, reinvented in a way that we allow more carbon to be stored, more carbon to be sequestered, whether it's in a natural forest, whether it's agricultural uh, lands, or in urban areas. And we, I can see uh, um, a number of, of uh, great initiatives in, in Vancouver, from urban gardening to um, more trees in, in some parts of the city. And I can see a lot, of, a lot more carbon could be sequestered in, in urban areas, for sure. Thank you, great presentations. Um, what are the three policy shifts that you would make at this stage, timing and where, and where does offsets fit in all of this? Nice question. So um, we didn't talk much about fossil fuels yet, but uh, I think this is a good moment to remind ourselves that Saving nature will, saving nature, saving forests will require fighting climate change, and we can only maintain these systems if we see greater efforts to reduce emissions. If we go ahead with new coal mines, LNG terminals, oil pipelines, uh, that will um, get us over dangerous um, levels of global warming. So I hope that in terms of um, government leadership, that we will see more leadership uh, step up to the plate, acknowledging that it is a climate crisis and greater efforts 
And that could start by um, uh, undertaking more work to really fully understand the carbon impacts of these projects. Uh, right now, we are discussing Enrich Pipeline in the context of five conditions, but um, climate emissions are not part of the five conditions, and there really should be um, more awareness, more policy discussions. And how far will this play a role in the decision? That's one example. Similarly, with forests, there should be um, more research and more um, uh, information to be used in policy discuss discussions. Right now, the BC government is taking a look at uh, forestry, primarily focusing on volume for mills, primarily focusing on um, raw log exports, but nowhere is a meaningful discussion how all of these uh, decisions will impact carbon emissions from forests. It should be a really prominent, should have a really prominent role in the discussion. And uh, one first step would be to a better accounting, more research, more accounting, um, and prepare the information in a way that can be used for decision making. Probably have some more. Huh? Just a thought that came up, and that is 10% um, of humans on the planet are responsible for 60% of the emissions, and we all know which group we belong to. And there's an honesty issue at every level about this. And, um, you know, policies that see climate as a real crisis would make it easier for us to deal with um, reducing emissions and increasing sequestration and preserving carbon sinks. Like, from, I, I think a policy issue should be that every eelgrass bed is off limits to everything except fish. I mean, it's not that much area in BC. It's only less than 400 square kilometres. Big deal. Let's do it. Um, yeah. Uh, which country does the best job of sustainably managing... Actually, I've got kind of three little questions. Which country does the best job of sustainably managing working forests? Uh, which comp like within BC, who does the best? Like particularly within either companies or regions? Are there places that are doing a really good job or a really bad job? And I heard that the BC, like, the BC government came out with that potential pretty wide-ranging change to the forestry regime here, that, and they dropped it because of the election. Uh, yeah. Are they bringing that thing back? Because it sounds like it might be a pretty massive change to the way the forests work, especially for smaller operations. Yeah, that's, that's right. So um, I cannot tell you which country on the planet does the best job in terms of managing forests. Um, I think that um, different countries have shown different approaches, some of them are more successful than others. I, I am amazed that some small countries like Costa Rica have a very high percentage of forests set aside in, in protected areas. That's, that's really remarkable. Way smaller country uh, com compared even to our province and um, I think similar number of people living there and they have about 25% in protected areas. Um, forest management generally is better in crowded places. For example, I'm from Germany and many European countries have uh, way more government staff budgets to manage forests because they have um, fewer forests remaining and they care more about them. <laughs> British Columbia is obviously in a very unique position, having a million square kilometers, large amounts of forest and a small population. It's tempting to, to have few people looking after your forests, but it's, um, it's also sad because it is a remarkable opportunity and we should all ask our governments to, to increase funding, increase budgets, to have more people taking care of our forest, understanding what is happening, particularly today. Um, you asked about different regions within the province. I, Either regions or companies, because I know there's some that are supposed to be pretty good and some that are not supposed to be now. When I mentioned the Great Bahrain Forest Agreement, uh, today is a very big day. If you have a, have a moment to read the newspaper, we have uh, uh, a lot to celebrate because we finished this proposal that's um, a milestone, it's not the final step. Uh, the proposal was developed by Sierra Club Greenpeace Forest Ethics with a group of companies, Western Forest Products, Interfor, BC Timber Sales, Catalyst Paper and House Sound Pulp and Paper. 
So we worked um, for a long period on, on this, and this is um, remarkable because we're talking about a region larger than Switzerland, and um, it is challenging to increase conservation from about 50 to 70 percent and, and get different parties buying into it. It's um, a lot of technical work to find ways that work uh, ecologically and economically, and now we hope that this will um, be reviewed by the provincial government and First Nations and uh, implemented in the near future, and that would definitely be a model not only for BC, not only for Canada, but people around the world care about this region and will, uh, will take note, and uh, this will definitely be a um, remarkable success. Lastly, you mentioned, um, I think, the 10-year uh, uh, rollover idea, which um, caused a lot of discussion and uh, opposition about um, just before the election, and uh, we, we hoped that it would not raise its ugly head again, but it's definitely out there. The idea of, um, of uh, changing 10-year uh, licenses to um, TFLs, tree farm licenses, which would give a number of big companies more control over public land and definitely make it more difficult to improve forest management, to ask for more, to ask for more conservation, to ask for fewer clear cuts, and we need these discussions and we um, should really keep our eyes on, on uh, our priorities. So we hope that um, the BC government will remember about the opposition and, and pursue other priorities. All right. Um, it seems like the Great Bear Rainforest is great success, and the uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada just brought out a methodology for offset programs um, in, in the forest industry. They're starting to sell some offsets um, in the Kootenays. Uh, now, did you see um, from the forest industry any interest in pursuing carbon offset programs, or is it viable to them at all? Um, in in uh, British Columbia, for example, in the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, the provincial government uh, has now um, made agreements with First Nations about carbon ownership. So it will benefit First Nations, it will benefit the province to a certain degree. They, they are interested because um, at least a few years back they were pursuing the goal of a carbon neutral government. Um, so it, it can be part of the solutions. Generally speaking, carbon offsets can be, become part of the solution if they are meaningful. I think that uh, in the Great Bear Rainforest, um, they are an important incentive because we are talking about um, moving from 50 to 70 percent. That's a high level of conservation where you need additional incentives to, to get buy-in. And it's also important uh, to note that First Nations have ownership in this. Um, many other parts of the world we see conflicts in the context of offsets, uh, particularly poorer countries, tropical countries where Aboriginal rights are not being respected. Uh, fortunately, the Great Bear Rainforest is a region where First Nations have now more um, decision-making power, so that's another reason. And what I pointed out earlier, this is about protecting old growth it will have an immediate benefit for the climate. It's not about promising to plant some trees that will maybe um, sequester carbon in 10 or 50 years. We're going to take our last question from Twitter. I have this one for you. This question comes from Quentin Lau. Is it possible to maintain the forest without destroying BC's forestry industry? Yes, and <laughs> I, I will give you an example. I, I actually um, was hoping that I can use this. Um, so some of you heard about wild wood, right? This um, forest managed by Merv Wilkinson on, on, on Vancouver Island. And this is great because it really demonstrates that, that logging can happen along a spectrum. It can happen, it can be a clear cut in an old growth forest or it can happen in a very careful, selective way in, in a second growth forest. And Merv Wilkinson harvested two million board feet of lumber from the wildwood parcel over 70 years of selective logging. 
with 1.3 million board feet of standing timber at the beginning and 1.6 million board feet at the end of his work at Wildwood. And that's really mind-boggling to think that you can actually harvest trees and increase your carbon stock over time. I think that answers the question. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentations. They're really great. I'm, I'm glad you guys are getting the word out and um, highlighting carbon as a, a viable um, option to pursue in terms of protecting these ecosystems. Uh, my name is Laura McCauley. I'm with Project Watershed, and we're cur currently embarking on a blue carbon uh, project that involves the development of a blue carbon protocol in BC with Vancouver Island University and the province of British Columbia. And uh, I've met Colin before, and we've discussed this. It's, uh, it's really great. I just wanted to talk about the offset question and respond to that. Um, there is a lot of interest in developing carbon offsets right now, um, and I think that it can be a viable option in different levels. Um, it can be done uh, to meet the highest standards. Uh, the results will be uh, probably a lower than reality carbon value, and in that case, it's really important to look at the other ecosystem benefits and values. And I'm just wondering, um, for both of you, are you pursuing management options on the ground that look at the, the multiple ecosystem values that are offered in blue carbon ecosystems as well as terrestrial? And, and I'm sorry, I'm just placing a dollar value on that in terms of um, fish use and bird use and um, well. other values. Well, Laura, you know more about offsets than I do. I know that. Um, in terms of management options, one of the things that interests me most is that it's been quite difficult at the international level to just get blue carbon offsetting going. And there's quite a bit of talk at a big oceans conference in Singapore a couple of years ago about bundling ecosystem services other than carbon along with carbon sequestration. Because in those parts of the world where seagrass most needs protection, people most depend on it. It's got like underdeveloped countries and so on. And it's very hard to sell an offset at the national level and then exclude people from the area because they rely on it. So the goal is to increase the value by, because local people are then responsible for keeping the system healthy and they can pay. And it, they, they can be paid to do that. So fisheries and other roles, uh, and even tourism, are being discussed as items that can be bundled along with carbon. So I'm pretty sure that doesn't precisely answer your question, but um, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. And Dr. Doug MacArthur would like to say a word at the end. Thank you very much. I just thank you, Claire. I wanted to say a word of thank you, actually, for everyone for coming. And uh, I, my, I'm Doug MacArthur. I'm a prof here, but I'm also chair of the board of Sierra Club BC. And I wanted to thank Carbon Talks for uh, having Sierra Club as part of your program and thank you for the programs you offer. And just say a word about Sierra Club BC. We're one of the leading environmental organizations in BC. We're evidence-based, science-based. Uh, and you see that the kind of people we have working with us as part of our, our te of team. And so uh, if any of you want to support Sierra Club BC, we'd really appreciate that too. But thank you very much for including Sierra Club BC on your program. Thank you, Doug.